Hello, everyone, and welcome to Saxworks Online and Learn with the List. This is the final Learn with the List in this wonderful series of five fantastic programs that we've been so happy to bring to you and share with you. And this one is going to be uh, fantastic, awesome, timely, useful, how to have complicated conversations. So really looking forward to that. Before we begin, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Rachel Sklar. I'm the VP of Programming and Content at Saxworks, and we'd love to welcome you into our spaces. Um, we, we're happy to welcome you virtually. We'd love to welcome you IRL. We have two spaces in New York at Saks Fifth Avenue Flagship and in Brookfield Place, uh, Saxfield, Saks, Saxworks Bessie, and also in Greenwich, Connecticut. And if you go to saxworks.com, you can download uh, or sign up for a complimentary day pass and come visit us and experience everything that Saxworks has to offer. We're a membership club with co-working and programming like this and, uh, and wellness programs and many plants. So if you like plants, really, you're going to love it. I, I usually just feel like the plants are going are gonna to be the thing that closes the deal. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Anne Chiquette uh, and she's going to launch our final learn with the list. Anne. Thank you, Rachel. I want to say particularly thank you and to Saxworks. This has been an amazing series. Um, we started this year with learn with the list with the idea that we needed to start 2022 on the right foot that we wanted. It wasn't a new year, new you. This was about building on our strength and our confidence and stepping into the year with our power. And in this final session, this conversation actually started on the list during the holidays. And we were all feeling a lot of anxiety around how did we go home to our families and have really complicated conversations about politics, about race, about money, <laughs> whatever the conversations were that we were all dreading, we felt that we needed a framework to discuss them. And I am thrilled to put this panel together. Chanel Cathy, who is an expert in strategic communications. Um, Thaler Picar, who is an expert in listening. And Elisa, who is who isn't frankly just an expert in so many amazing things, but really in productive dialogue. And so I leave you in tremendously good hands. Um, please write your questions into the chat. I will be um, fielding them to Chanel during the Q&A session. Um, and uh, Chanel, I'm gonna leave it to you to take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you all for joining us today. I am thrilled to be here on this panel on how to have complicated conversations. I'm Chanel Cathy, as Anne mentioned, founder and CEO of CJC Insights. We're a boutique communications and PR agency in New York City. Um, and I have the great pleasure of moderating today's talk. Um, and I'm excited to even save time at the end for your questions, as Anne mentioned too. Um, I'm honored to be joined by the brilliant minds um, on the boxes you're seeing before you. Um, they're really incredible leaders in communications and storytelling. Uh, Thaler Picar, a communications and story expert who advises global leaders in Fortune 500 companies for over 17 years. She's the founder of Thaler Picar Partners. Uh, Elisa Kamahart Page, a multi hyphenate communications dynamo um, who I know her work from the found as she was the you know former co-founder of Blog Her. She's also the author of Roadmap for Revolutionaries: Resistance, Activism, and Advocacy for All. She also is the principal of Elisa CP Consulting. So with that, let's really dive in. I think everyone here has really mastered our fair share of complicated and complex conversations whether we're working at home or in the office, um, whether we're with family or around the dinner table or with friends, we are navigating the world and a lot polarizing and sometimes complex conversations are being had. So how do we initiate conversation? How do we respond? You always know there are those masters of timing and people who infuse humor at exactly the right point. Well, that's actually a lot of skills to do that. <laughs> so we really want to dive in on how do we get better at doing it? Um, how do we listen? Um, how do we give feedback? Um, and how do we really express the things that we're passionate about? Um, so let's first break down the core components of a conversation. 
They're speaking and listening, which I think is pretty obvious, but not always easy to do all at once. Um, so let's start with Thalar. You talk about the importance, not just of speaking, but really mastering listening. So tell me more about balancing both and how that's key for effective communications. Thank you, Chanel. It's a pleasure to be here, here with Alyssa as well. Um, in all conversations, and especially in complicated conversations, what you want to say doesn't matter as much as what the other person hears, right? The meaning of your words are actually determined by the listener. Um, and so we're only going to learn what they're hearing by listening to them, um, by shutting up by sitting back, by pausing, by checking in with them, by asking them if they're feeling heard as well, um, by checking for resonance with them. Uh, but the thing is that people need to be told that they have a responsibility and also a right to listen. We're told and praised for our oratory, but this idea of being told that you have a responsibility and to listen to people and that you can take the time to listen uh, is really what I want to get across and that we need to create spaces where listening can actually be balanced, where people can hear and be heard at the same time. Um, one of the tools that I like to think about is that we have to end what I call premature articulation, right? Premature articulation, all conversational partners are left unsatisfied. We speak too soon and we do that um, sometimes out of benevolence, sometimes because we wanna move a conversation forward faster, um, sometimes because we're eager to get to consensus to reduce tension. But when we do that, we're bringing all of our own biases to the table um, and we are we're bringing our own confirmation biases that these people must be agreeing and in consensus because I'm hearing what I want to hear. Um, so the great thing is to try to balance this idea of speaking and listening. And when you do that, you get the benefit that when you listen more, you actually speak better. I love that. And then you know, Elisa, do you want to chime in on that? And I think the point that's really great that Thaler's raising is that point of tension. So how, what tips do you give when a conversation starts to escalate, when people are not quite hearing each other? What tips do you give to actually have a productive conversation? Well, I, for many years now, I've been in two worlds, both the world of business, primarily marketing and communications, but also the world of politics and activism and advocacy. And some years back when I was preparing a, a, a media training session for a client, I became struck by the similarities between what is effective messaging and marketing and media communications and what is effective dialogue about any topic. And I really break it down into four things that I think are really important to keep in mind for both situations. The first is be prepared in that if you know you're going in to discuss a certain topic or you expect a certain topic to come up, think of a couple of talking points, something you really, your message that you really want to be heard, what might be called a pull through message in media training. Like what is, what is the main sentiment you want to convey? But as you're doing that, um, be aware that to speak for yourself. So many people go down bad roads when they're being interviewed by media or bad roads when they're having a political conversation because they assume what other people are thinking and saying. But Thaler's point is key, which is if you want to know what someone else is thinking or saying, ask them, you know, and then listen. You can't, you don't know. And I've had many conversations with people with whom I strongly disagree. And you know what? They are not monolithic, just like we are not monolithic. So um, be prepared to ask the questions and speak for yourself. The other thing you can speak for is data. You know, if you know the data, if you have some data you can reference, great. But don't get pulled into now trying to explain things that you don't really know. If you don't know, you don't know. Say you don't know. Um, and the fourth thing is, I really believe this is true in marketing and in political dialogue. Be for something. Speak a lot more about why you're for something than why you're against something else, whether it's your competitor or a political um, 
opponent. Uh, people resonate with your passion about what you believe in, and people can find points of connection and relevance and maybe empathy. Um, when you're way more uh, focused on sharing the thing you love versus attacking or criticizing. I'm, I'm not saying this never happens that you want to, you know, be strongly against something and explain why, but I like to try and find when I'm preparing my pull through messages and my way of articulating what I bring to a conversation, I really like to try to figure out how to frame it as to what I'm for. So for example, I'm for justice, I'm for equity, I'm for you know, I'm for these things and what they look like and what they would bring to the world and what I think the advantages are. That's what I want to convey more than saying that the people who are not for that are, are bad and I disagree with them. Like for me, that kind of goes without saying once you've said what you're for. I think that's great. And, and you're talking about opinions and oftentimes when you have to interject with an opinion or wait for that, you know, that nice pause at the end to get your point in, what's the best way to get in? So, you know, we mm -hmm. talked about this kind of offline. I'm a huge fan of the sandwich method. So for those of you who are like, what is she talking about? I'm not great at super direct feedback. It's definitely something I have to work on, but I often will say something great about what you're working on. I'll sandwich in the difficult feedback in the middle. And then, you know, let's end on an optimistic point at the end. Like, how do we move forward? But I know, Elisa, you kind of <laughs> met that with resistance and Thaler also has some tips as well. Um, maybe let's figure out which tactic do you think might work best? <laughs> First of all, I think everybody's different. And if it works for you, it works for you. Like I'm not here to tell people something they do is wrong if it works. Here's why I don't use that method personally. Um, one strong belief I have in, in, particularly if we're talking about team communications, one strong belief I have is that people should never be surprised um, by feedback at their review. Like you have chances to give them feedback all the way around all the time. You have chances to give positive reinforcement all the time. You have chances to give constructive feedback all the time. So I feel like it should be much more of an ongoing dialogue and, and not something that happens at only prescribed times. But the other reason I personally don't use the sandwich method, having had a manager who was super into it is because that forever after, once I figured out that was the method, I never got a compliment without waiting for the other shoe to drop. And that was my personal feeling. Like I just knew it wasn't always true. I'm not even saying it was always true. There were plenty of times I was complimented without criticism, but I would get that little, you know, hitch in my stomach that uh, someone's saying something nice to me, that must mean something mean is, is following. And I understand constructive feedback is not mean, uh, but you know what? I'm talking about emotional response. So that's my personal take based on personal experience with exactly that thing. Yeah, and I think that personal experience is so important. And Thaler, you also have kind of a trademarked approach that I think everyone on here can really benefit from hearing from. So tell us a little bit more about heart, head, and hand. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Chanel. Um, all communications is a means to an end goal, right? There's a reason why you're talking to someone. Sometimes you want them to invest a million dollars in your business. And sometimes if you're having a glass of wine with a girlfriend, you want them to feel better about their breakup. You just want them to smile. But there's a reason why you're speaking. And if there isn't, then you're bloviating and you're just being really disrespectful to the person. Um, but and what heart, head, and hands is, is it's a participatory process and the order is crucial. It's about setting intent and it's about ending with a call to action. Um, so it's asking, what is it that I want from this conversation? How do I want the other person to feel? What do I want them to do? It's about how do I invite this person in. Chris Rock talks about how every joke needs a welcome mat in front of it, that a person knows that the joke is for them, that they can step across the threshold and into the joke. And I want people to know that this communication is for them, that you're finding a point of resonance for them. You're, you're being respectful from the get-go and framing this within their life experience. People can only relate to things that 
they already know. They can only relate it to experiences they have. And so our job as communicators, especially in complicated conversations, is to think about that relationship. So that's the heart part. And then only after you've delivered that heart, after you've set a framework for where the information can go, do you deliver the data. Then you can connect uh, the facts and the points and you can put that out um, and that's the head part. Um, and then finally, you go back to remembering your intent, which is the purpose and why you're speaking and why you've been asking for attention. And that's the hand. What is it that you want from the person? What do you want to leave in their hand? So it's an intentional process that rather pushing at people with facts alone, you're pulling them in, you're inviting them into a dialogue that makes sense and is meaningful for them. And you're relationship building better that way. It's not as transactional, I think, when you, you're bringing something to the table as well. Um, you know, something I would like to add, if you don't mind, is um, we've been talking a lot about how to listen to the other person and, and um, you know, how to approach them. Um, I think there is in, biz, in feedback, team feedback situations, there's a really important aspect of knowing what they want from you when they are bringing you a problem. When you're in the middle of a difficult conversation, um, if someone comes into your office and they have something they really need to get off their chest, I would often ask people, are you looking for me to give you um, brainstorming feedback, assistance? Can I help you? Should we talk this out? Are you just looking to vent right now? Do you need me to go fight a battle for you? Like what, what, what is your expectation of me from this conversation so that I can be listening in a frame that will most likely end at the end of the conversation with us being on the same page. So in addition to just asking them questions about their, their, their head and heart and hand, which you will do, it's also getting right to the heart. Just ask out loud, what do you want from me? Um, and I think a lot of times we don't do that and we end up kind of talking at cross purposes. Uh, so I, I just wanted to throw that in there as one of the really specific questions I like to ask in these kinds of conversations. I love that, Alyssa. It's about partnership and mm. so much dignity at the get-go because you're also getting off of your throne and you're saying to the person, I'm going to sit alongside you. It's really beautiful. Yeah, and I think you both are just also honing in on how we each come into a conversation with our own experiences, with our own identity. And, you know, we're in these moments where things are so polarized. It is very difficult. And sometimes it's hard to know what might be a sensitive topic for someone. So I, I think one thing I really want to talk about, you know, how do we lean in to some of that tension? How do we, you know, not offend others? How, how do we check ourselves to make sure that we're self-aware? Um, but also how, if we're hitting that roadblock and someone's just not at a position or at the right time to hear your message, what's the best route to reroute the conversation? Maybe Thaler, do you want to drive in? I love that you talked about timing because context is everything. And again, I, I started out talking about creating spaces and creating um, places where people feel that they can be heard. Um, so it, again, it's that mutuality. Um, I'd like to hear more from you, Chanel, actually, about this idea of um, showing up and, and self-awareness in, in these situations. Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on it earlier where we're, we don't have all of the answers. And I think sometimes as communication experts, we're in that difficult spot of like everyone comes to you for the answers. So even that's a first question I ask people, like where, what don't you know? I don't need to know what you know, but what's something that we need to work on? What's something you're not comfortable diving in on? And that's the area for learning and saying, okay, how do we stretch you as a person? And for me too, I do that. I'm like, hey, I mess up all the time and that's where I need to do the hard work. So I think it's also, to me, self-awareness is so key in saying, what do I need to grow? Like, where do I need to grow? How can I engage myself better? Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to be in community with? And I think just being self-aware and saying, sometimes you might say something and 
intent is a completely different thing. It might take a whole new meaning than what you might mean. You know, I love emojis. And one time I just didn't put emojis in an email and people called me like, are you okay? Are you moody? And I'm like, just left the emojis out. But people have your unique style. And I think how you communicate, whether it's something so small, like an emoji or an exclamation mark, or, you know, for me, if it's just like hi and a period, it's direct. So someone's going to say, hey, are you okay about this? So you're also sending small signals in many ways. So I often tell managers and I tell, you know, my clients, like pay attention to the small signals because there's often a buildup. And as soon as you see that first thing, take a pause, go back, reread, um, listen again, and try and internalize that to make sure that you aren't stepping on a line, a landmine because you can I think self-awareness is very important. And in some circles, you might call it reading the room. Um, self-awareness, not, not just in one-on-one -on -one interactions, but within a group and kind of understanding where you're aligning and is that where you want to align. But to your point about communication, um, I don't think always our goal should be, oh, I should make sure I don't offend anybody. I don't think you y'all were saying that. You know, sometimes you're going to say something and people are not going to agree. They're going to feel strongly. They might get offended. Um, I do believe in all those things I said before to try to make the dialogue as productive as possible. But at the end of the day, I have strong beliefs. I'm going to share them and not everybody's going to like it. And I have to be self-aware enough to say, you know, some people aren't, I'm not for everybody. Not everyone's going to like me. That's okay. But, but I think I will, I will share a little thing I did a, a little thing I've done to how I write email to your point of what you were talking about, Chanel. Um, years and years ago, the 2005, when my two blogger co-founders, Lisa Stone and Joy Desjardins and I were planning the very first blogger conference, we were all virtual, not because of a pandemic, but because we didn't have an office. We lived in three very far flung parts of the Bay Area. And so we, we met once every couple of weeks, but otherwise we wrote email. And Jory and I had a somewhat more similar cultural background, I think. Um, and Lisa was raised by a Southern mother who I think infused a different kind of cultural expectation. So Jory and I would send these emails that were very like, hey, this, bah, bah, bye, you know, like, and, and one time Lisa sent us this email, you guys, I just need a little bit of human kindness. Could you greet me? Could you say like, man, I, I need that. And so it really checked. It really, I had to check myself. And now I do three, I write an email three times, basically in very quick succession. I'm not saying this takes forever. First, I write just what I want to say in my own kind of, bah, 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 you know, direct. Then I go and add the, what Lisa would have called the human kindness. And then I go and remove any place where I have undercut myself or qualified myself, you know, all those, I believe, or if you think so, or all, all those kind of things, you know, that, that are, um, so, uh, so likely to happen that undercut your own message. Um, and it only takes, I'm so used to it now. It only takes a minute, but, uh, it, it really made me self-aware about something. And that just because something is my style and I happen to be vibing with someone else who has the same style doesn't mean I cannot have the flexibility to adjust my style, to create a better working relationship. It, it costs me me nothing. I could get defensive. I could push back and say, Hey, you know, I, why do I, you know, I have human kindness, you know, I love you. Like, but you know, it's really okay to be like, Oh, this will take so little and it will make a difference every single time. So that was a, a really big learning 15 years ago or so. I love that. I love that. You know, yeah. Do you have any that in? yeah. I wanted to say that there's a, there's kind of a liberal trope to say and to assume we all want the same things. And we don't, we don't all want the same things. And I think if there's anything that we can learn about how to have complicated conversations, how to speak and how to listen, it's to allow everyone to be as magnificently complex as we are ourselves. Yeah, and that changes by the minute sometimes. Mm -hmm. I love that. Not everybody wants the same thing. And I think kind of in there, we're, we're talking about how do you build better teams? How do you identify different communication styles? And how do you kind of sometimes shape kind of team culture around your communication styles? Um, I'm also thinking about something that's a big kind of, it's a big piece that people don't want to and often don't want, like to talk about. Um, and that's 
the power dynamic in conversations. Um, so can we just touch on that influence, whether it's in delivering feedback or receiving a message? If you're receiving something from your boss as feedback, it's a lot different than how you're receiving it from a peer. So can we talk about that power play? <laughs> I also had an early formative experience. I was living in New York right after college. I was working in the garment district to support myself. And a company came in and bought the fashion designer I was working for. And they came from a particular cultural approach to, to interacting with team that the new guy who was going to come in and run everything sat down with each employee. They weren't that, I mean, it was a small company and asked all our all our feedback and what we thought, what could go better and what could this and what could that. And we all had many similar, the people on the lower rung, so to speak, we had a lot of thoughts and we shared them and he nodded his head. And then he didn't do any of that. He, he, for him, the asking was the benefit we should take from it. Isn't it so nice to be asked? And I forever thought I'm never going to make someone spin their wheels like that again, if I don't mean it. And so now I'm really clear with team members, like if they can change my mind, you know, is my mind made up? Can you change my mind? Like, what would it take to change my mind? Like, give it, give it your shot because, but if I'm really, if I know this is the final answer, I'm not going to waste someone's time. And, um, because they know, and you know, if you're the manager, they know, and you know, if you, at the end of the day, make the call. So if you've already made the call, like save everybody some energy. Um, and, and if you're, as I said, if you're having this kind of constructive feedback and transparent um, style with your team all the way along, like none of this should be a surprise and no one decision should make an employee feel like they're in, they're in or they're out, they're good or they're bad with you. No one um one thing that you have to tell them is what's going to happen should be the make or break because all along you've been in this kind of exchange. Uh, and that's what I really think makes the biggest difference for team satisfaction. I'm also checking out, if you see me reading, I'm also checking out questions that are coming in. And there's one that I think might be really interesting to kind of throw in now. And um, I think it's Casey Clark. It's when you're in conversation with someone um, who's purposely firing people up, maybe they're using negativity, maybe it's fear. Do you have ideas on how do you diffuse in that moment? Yes, keep the questions coming because I can think of <laughs> Um, a lot of times I will ask someone, you know, to, to sort of dig deeper because if someone's like purposely trying to rile people up, it's often with sort of surface level, but this could happen and that could happen. One of the things I truly believe helps us is if we actually imagine what's the worst that could happen in a scenario. Um, and then we just get really detailed about it. And I always tell the story about going two years without a paycheck when we started blog her and I was down to really nothing. And if we hadn't gotten that first round of funding, we probably would have closed the business. And, but I had already imagined like, if I, if this doesn't happen and now I have no money, what will I have to do to get back on track? And it wasn't like a Greek tragedy. It was, oh, I'll have to get a job, you know, like, okay. Um, and so when someone's really in that kind of fear mode, I really believe in asking them more questions about, well, what does that look like? Well, what is the most disturbing thing? Well, what are you afraid? How are you afraid that's going to impact you? Well, um, what part of your life do you think that will have? And either if it's all kind of puffery and they're riling up for riling up sake, they won't really have a lot of answers or they'll be really stretching and reaching and, you know, it'll kind of peter out. But if they're really afraid and really angry and really stoking up, like having the opportunity to express why and just l listening to them um, and not shutting them down uh, may actually be more helpful in the long run. You know, I had a couple hecklers on when I did book events for this because it is written from a feminist perspective. And I, I had people who came to the book event to like complain to me and they were really shocked when I didn't like get them tossed and I didn't have like an aggressive response. And I just sort of said, well, tell me more about why that bothers you so much. And it just kind of, you know, wound down because they weren't expecting to be listened to. I find it so interesting that that question came from Casey because I actually use some of Casey's tips to calm down. I grew up in a very non-angry household. Mm. It wasn't um, 
Yeah, just wasn't angry. So when I have people who come at me with anger, I can get riled up way too quickly. And I, I practice that breathing. I practice um, staying in that moment. I practice compassionate curiosity, which is a lot of what Alyssa is saying. What is this about you? I have to say just recently, I was in um, a conversation with two very dear, dear old friends and it got surprisingly contentious. I was very surprised at some of the things that this friend was saying to me. And um, I was just listening and listening. I wasn't going to persuade her. There was no point. We were not going at each other. And my husband asked something that I thought was really great because she was riled. And Tom eventually said, who is they? Mm. And I think we hear this in a lot of these complicated conversations, people who have been infused by rhetoric that's coming at them from radio that wants them to repeat those messages. And it's they, they, they. And asking that question, who is they, can get someone to sit back and pause. Hmm. That's a great, I'm gonna have to remember that. I also think that it's not my mission to win every argument or get into every argument. And I don't consider it my mission to convert people. I, I believe that um, I see a slight difference in the term evangelism versus conversion. Um, that I do wanna talk about everything I'm for and tell you why I'm for it. Um, I don't wanna focus on making you I, my story should be enough for you to think about it. Like I'm not asking for a conversion. And I often say there are people who are really, really good at engaging in long threads with people, particularly strangers on the internet, where they really get into it. That is not my mission. Uh, my mission, I often have a little um, guiding principle I repeat to myself, which is I'm here to be helpful, not to argue with strangers on the internet. And if I've shared something and trying to be helpful and I get met a few times with sort of, um, the talking points you talk about or something where they're not really dialoguing with me. They just want to harangue me. Like if it's a stranger on the internet, I, I just walk away. Like I let them get the last word. I, I'm not invested in having the last word. And I, it's not, but some people they're really good at it. And it's not, apparently it's not bad for their mental health. It would be very bad for my mental health to do that all day long. When it's friends, um, you know, it's, I think a lot of us may have experienced that there are certain folks in our lives that we're not as close to anymore because of what's gone on in the last five to 10, I would take it even longer, five to 10 years as um, discourse degraded in this particular country. And, you know, with some of those folks, that's okay. Uh, and with some of those folks, you might be experiencing a lot more pain about it. And in that case, you have to ask yourself, what is that pain how much is it worth to you? Like where, where you, you have to investigate it with yourself. You can't investigate what could I do to convert this person because you probably can't that. And it's probably not very productive to try to keep relations going so you can convert someone. So it's really just a decision you can make to yourself. Is this, is this bad enough that I'm going to withdraw or am I going to ask for conversations not to touch a certain area, or am I going to, you know, what am I going to do? Because I can't control them. What were you going to say, Thaler? Oh, no, I wasn't going to interrupt you, Alyssa. Please finish. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say that, that you can't control them. You can only control you. And that, that was what all I was going to say. I, I wanted to go back to Chanel's question about power, because you brought up engagement. And it's not just power over who gets to speak, who gets to listen, but it's power over who gets to engage, right? Not everybody has mm. that, the power to say, I don't wanna talk right now. This is a really bad time for me. And if we are in positions of power, right? It was Toni Morrison who said, if you have some power, then your job is to empower someone else. So get off of that throne, suppress it, give, give the platform to, to someone else, you will feel subordinate, right? It takes a lot of cognitive energy to tamp down and, and to suppress a response to someone because you're giving up your agency and letting someone else control the conversation. But a lot of people have never had the opportunity to be listened to. A lot of people have never fully had that. And if, <clears throat> excuse me, if we can create spaces where people have dignity and they're respected and they can come in with their agency, then we can build trust, then we can build productivity. If we're willing 
uh, to share that power. And if I could just rail on one thing for a minute, because I think it has implications uh, for other things. I despise what I consider a, a torturous and obligatory request for people to be vulnerable. You know, when, when a leader comes in, when someone says, I want you all to be vulnerable, or please be vulnerable, or you need to be vulnerable. A lot of people don't have a choice to be vulnerable, right? Age, um, uh, gen, right? youth and old age make people vulnerable. Climate change makes people vulnerable. Poverty makes people vulnerable. Lots of things contribute to vulnerability. And I think it's an awful power play. It's supremacist to say to people, please be vulnerable. Your job is to create the space where people can choose to be vulnerable. Uh, you just said a word, man. Uh <laughs> <laughs> the little emoji. <laughs> That's so true. And I don't think I've ever thought about it in quite that way. Wow. You just really got me. It's yeah. You know, it's about boundaries, right? Conversations, difficult conversations require boundaries. You are allowed to set your own boundaries. The other person is allowed to set their boundaries. People think often because I'm on the internet and have been for many, many years. And I talk about all the taboo subjects um, that they know me and everything about me. Um, they don't even notice. This is the thing. Nobody actually notices that I never talk about my partner. I don't really talk about my family. I don't really talk about, you know, me. I talk about my beliefs and my opinions. No one really notices. And they think they know me hundred percent. And there's a whole chunk of me. No, nope, people don't know. And that's okay. That's my choice. And I used to always say back in the day when we were working with so many mommy bloggers, for them, they were talking about everything about their personal life and weren't necessarily going to talk about politics or religion or race or sex or whatever. Uh, and I'm the opposite. And both things are okay. Both things. We get to choose what we are open and share about, and we get to choose what we're vulnerable about, vulnerable about and we cannot choose to make other people conform to our expectation of what that word means. That's great. And I, I also think too, um, I always say there's like, you're always in the conversation if you're in the room. And I mean that in the sense of like, there's this, the bystander effect, which is like, if you're witnessing a conversation, what is the role of like getting involved if you're on the sideline watching something that might be escalating? So I'm just curious, what are your thoughts there on like managing those tough moments, but you're not exactly the one that's in conversation? Mm, I mean, can I ask you to clarify, do you mean like if you're observing a difficult conversation happening between people you know, and if you can try to be a mediator? Pretty much. Like, is there the role of, I, you know, I'll give myself as an example at work. It's like, if I'm watching a situation escalate between a manager and someone on their team, and maybe, you know, I'm not even speaking, you know, kindness or whatever, but you're at work and you're like, how do I diffuse the situation? So one thing that I often say to my mentees is like, if you feel yourself about to cry, if you feel something welling up, just say, you know what, I'd like to revisit this. I'm just going to take a, a minute to go to the restroom. And I always call it like the restroom pause, just go back, regroup yourself and come back. But a lot of folks, and you pointed to it, and sometimes it's that power dynamic that's in there, they might not be in a position to kind of take that moment for themselves to go and regroup, but you might be witnessing it on the outside. And I feel like in my career, I've just witnessed so many people on the outside that never quite step in because they're like, that's a conversation for those two. So do you have any tactics, especially, you know, at work or wherever? And I'm seeing a lot of in the uh, Q&A about like, you know, how do you change the subject? How do you infuse humor? So I'm just curious if you're not directly the one in the conversation, is there a role there to kind of help step in and maybe advocate in behalf of somebody else? I think, I think it, uh, no, go ahead, Thaler. Uh, it goes back to your um, being self-aware, Chanel, and, and knowing how much power you do have in that situation. So if you can say like, if you can pivot the conversation, if you can actually interrupt and say, let's, let's change or let's, let's take a breather for a minute. And if you don't feel you have the power to speak that way, knock over a damn glass of water, like create a commotion, do something that's going to change 
the dynamic for that moment and buys time for the person who uh, is being bullied. I'll, I'll use that term. I mean, anyone can ask for a bio break if you're in a meeting. Um, it doesn't matter. And, and I think asking for a bio break in the middle of a heated exchange is going to send the message, you know, adequately, you know, that this is, this is, this is affecting us all physically, basically, which is what that kind of interaction, observing that kind of interaction will do. I do think that the power dynamic plays in here because who is it that you want to approach? If you want to approach someone who, you know, you're um, theoretically at a higher level than them and you want to approach them about their behavior with someone. Um, I don't know if you watch Ted Lasso, but there's a, there were a couple of scenes this season where coach Beard kind of let the younger coach Nate know that what he was doing wasn't cool. And he didn't bring it to Nate's boss, which was ultimately their boss because, you know, he was trying to do that mentoring himself. Yes, Nate the snake, Rachel, you are right. Um, uh, he was trying to do that mentoring himself, not bring in the big boss and, and try to do a little handholding. Um, and I've, I think I've been in that position many times where you're trying to sort of, let's not escalate this, but let's, you and I deal with it. It's harder if you're on a position where you don't feel where these are people who are operating above your pay grade. And um, I think it is really incumbent on leaders. And that can mean everything from just a line manager all the way up to leaders to really speed the plow and smooth the way for people who are on you know, the uprise of their career to have better experiences with leaders and leadership. And you can take a, a place in that. You can talk to the person and, uh, you know, I often would have conversations um, and I would ask, I would often ask the question, like, what, what is the negative intent you're assuming? Like, what, if, what would be the, what would be the most, the best possible interpretation for how this is playing out? Because we don't know why people do what they do. So we make, we tell stories to ourselves and I do think people have natural tendencies to tell themselves good stories and tell themselves scary stories. You know, we, it's kind of a little bit feels baked in, um, but we can also interrupt that mechanism and ask like, what is the story that you, you're hearing in this about why they're doing that? And, and either A, why don't we just ask them or what would be the story that would explain it that was a really generous interpretation? Um, and often just, you know, if you're going to try and assume what other people are thinking, assume best, assume worst, which one seems more likely, you know, usually the best case scenario is more likely people aren't working for you because they want to screw you up. People aren't trying to work on a partnership with deal with you because they really want to screw you, you know, generally speaking, you know, so usually they're much more unaware of your needs and not thinking about your needs, then, oh, I really want to know what their needs are so I can absolutely not do that and get the upper hand. That's like not actually a thing most of the time. Yeah, I think that's great. And I'm seeing um, other questions, Miranda Burner, how to exit a difficult conversation. A lot of these points that we're bringing up, you know, I kind of am still chuckling at knock over a glass of water because <laughs> I'm naturally a klutz. So that's going to be my new default. But I do think so many of those points that you all were, were mentioning hit on that. Is there anything else you might add if you're like at the end of a combo and you're, or maybe you're just trying to like wrap it up? I know one of my personal tactics, I call it like my summary mechanism, which is if I'm not sure that we're hearing each other the same way, I'm going to repeat it the way that I hear it. And then hopefully, you know, if you're on the other side of that, you can hear me and be like, wait, wait, no, you missed the whole point. Um, it's easier at work than in your personal relationships, but I often say, just summarize it and say, hey, just to bring this full circle, to bring this back around, this is what I'm hearing, X, Y, Z. And then, you know, and before we walk away from this conversation, here's what I want to say. So I think you can kind of insert that pause, that break in the conversation, but Thayla, I wonder, do you have anything to add that might What's another pretty bow that we can kind of put on things sometimes to step out of the conversation and hopefully meet each other again? I worked with a horrific narcissist uh, for several years. And uh, what I learned to say was help me understand, right? So that was putting the, he loved it because it was then about him and he was helping me, um, but it was a way to frame it so that he could, 
summarize to your point, you know, am I hearing this correctly? You said something, you mentioned a word in the beginning, Shell, when you said, if you're, in, if you're sitting in the corner and you're hearing something happen, I want to make a case for listening to the corners too. Mm -hmm. And I want to make a case for making sure that we bring everybody into conversation. And I'm making this for several reasons here. One, because we need to listen to everybody and we need to be listening for what we're not listening to. Um, two, because innovation, great things, important things are happening at the corners. If you think of um, a biosphere uh, metaphor, right, right at, at the edges is where the most interesting stuff is happening. Um, and also to that idea of how do we uh, interrupt a conversation, you can ask other people to be heard. I think we're hearing a lot from Bob. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'd like to hear um, from some other people in the room. And I mean, I will say that this is when it's helpful that you've had that kind of approach all the way, even when the conversations aren't difficult, it, to have that approach of listening to the corners and hearing from folks. Um, then when you are in a stressful conversation, the person who gets, hey, let's hear from other folks in the room is not all of a sudden feeling the weight of trying to end a conflict. So it's an ongoing practice, I would say, of having that approach to conversations. I often say that with this remote work that we've all been thrown into, meetings have become a little more democratized. We're all the same size in a Zoom box, I guess, or whatever it is. But um, the thing is, you can, the one thing I think that could really change about the way people engage is to remember that not everybody processes information or gives response at the same speed in the same way. They, they don't take it in nor give it out in the same way. And meetings are really geared towards external processors. They're really geared towards the person who is successful, the person who can jump in with a you know, brainstorming right away with an idea and like really get into the conversation. And it leaves out a lot of internal processors who maybe need a little more time. And so I think infusing meetings with opportunities to take a moment and everyone spend five minutes writing down an idea um, or, and the, the, this is where the value of setting up a structure, setting up an infrastructure of, I'm always gonna send you the agenda and tell you what I expect from your conversation at this meeting. I'm always gonna wrap up and reiterate what we decided or what we need to do out of this meeting. And in the meeting, I'm always gonna take a moment to let everyone, no matter how they process, take in or give out information, a way for them to participate. Then when you get into complicated conversations, you have established a framework in which people might be feel safer to um, you know, express themselves, to break up tension. Um, I think this is just a really rethinking how you drive your communications in general is what allows you to be better prepared for the complicated ones. So I hope we've given some um, you know, advice that's useful, not just for the complicated conversations, but for all of your conversations. I love that. And I also will just say um, to everyone on, I know we're coming up on 10 minutes. If you have questions, drop them in the chat and q and I'll try and get to them. We'll try and lightning fire, get through everything. Um, but you also both touch on a point too, where we're talking about the folks who are really extrovert that are out there with their opinions and they have no hesitancy doing that. But often, you know, a lot of us are introverts, you know, sometimes speaking up is really hard. And, you know, sometimes you get one word answers. Yes, no, I don't know, perhaps. What are some of your tips for pulling out like more information? And I like to call it, how do you pull a vibe from someone <laughs> that might be limiting uh, kind of how much they're giving? Maybe, it, and that can come from any number of reasons. Maybe they're just unsure of the environment, but how do you engage folks in a deeper way where they give you a little bit more? Well, I like to exercise my inner toddler. And this is where the asking questions comes in. But here's the key. I can't ask questions already thinking of my next response or ask questions because I want to show out that they don't really know what they're talking about. Um, when I ask, and why is the, oh, why do you, why do you say that? Oh, why do you think that? Oh, like, what is it? Give me an example. Like, and you have to be sincere. 
Like if you're not doing it sincerely, then it's useless. I think you have to really want to know. And if you, and it's okay, if you don't, this is what I keep trying to, you know, tell people it's okay. If you don't want to engage, we don't have to engage with everybody all the time, but if you're going to engage, have that sincere interest. And if, if someone's not talking, all you can do is ask them questions that allow them open, you know, an open arena in which to express themselves where you are conveying to them that you really want to know and, and that you are there waiting. And I also think we need to give people more time. Um, a lot of times when we say like, this is after speaking engagements, when you're doing Q and A or in meetings, when you're doing, and you say, um, so does anybody have any questions or does anybody have any thoughts? And then we are so comfortable with silence. And so we, we jump right in again and giving people time and, and, and again, not in judgment, you're totally open, you're waiting, you have to convey it with your body and your face and your voice that we can sit here for five minutes and think about it if you want, but it's okay. Silence is is okay. Yeah, to to Alyssa's point of asking for examples, ask for stories, ask someone, tell me about a time, practice narrative humility, which is leaving yourself open to saying, I don't know, right? Celebrate your ignorance. If we could just all go around celebrating how dumb we are, that we don't know things. And again, we don't know the person before us. You can't possibly know me, right? You haven't walked in my shoes throughout my life. You you don't know who another person is. This is why I like moving beyond empathy. Mm. You have to practice this narrative humility, which is akin to cultural humility in understanding that not knowing is at the core. So if you can ask people, help me understand, tell me about a time, uh, give me a picture of that. And there's a lot of journalists on this call, um, ask how questions, which is how did that unfold? How did that happen? Now make sure you're passing what I call the the you idiot test, which is not how did that happen. If you could add <laughs> you, if you could add the words you idiot at the end of a question, you shouldn't be asking it. But if you could really ask how how leads to causality, and then you start to see a story unfold. Oh my God! You just gave me total um, flashback to a boss I had very early in my career who every time, you know, a little simple mistake would get made. These are not serious, like strategic errors. These were, oh, I wrote the wrong number or whatever. And he would say, how did that happen? And I was like, I am human. I I don't know. I didn't do it on purpose. I assure you, but it was really, it's amazing how all our bad bosses of our youth really help make us better. We should, we should just find them all and thank them. I love that. And then um, just one more, I see one coming in from Anat who said, how do you balance um, between being brutally honest and Mm. not hurting someone? Which I think is a tough one. That is a tough one. And I think it might be um, a little different in personal versus professional engagements because Yeah, I think you think you would think that the people who are closest to you would be most in need of your brutal honesty, but you're going to have to be with them your whole lifetime. So I'm not sure I agree that they are. Um, I think that, you know, it's a whole thing, this brutal honesty, radical candor. um, And I'm not exactly a an acolyte of the philosophy. I feel like although I I just spent a whole bunch of time talking about how I don't like the compliment, uh, the feedback sandwich. I also feel like if, if you need someone, if that there is a point of not just telling someone the brutal negative truth, if you can't tell them anything to do about it, um, I I feel like then you're not going to, you're not planning for a conversation. If you can't tell them anything you think about what, where they go from there, then you're doing a one-off and you're doing it. It's an, you know, it's a dead end conversation. And who gives you like, why well, you really have to investigate what, why you're going to do that. Um, I feel like you have to find the seed of where you go from there and you're having a conversation, then it's going in a direction. Then you're building a relationship that is based on, you know, candor, um, and not just creating a bunch of dead end like conversations that, and do you really need to do that? Like, 
there's people I feel like don't need my feedback. Like we're not, we don't have that kind of relationship. You know, I feel like I have to be in relationship with someone to tell them, you know, just how much of an asshole they are, I guess. I, I use the heart head hands for, for that because to Alyssa's point, it brings you to what's the progress. What's the change that you want to see made and it's progress, not payback, right? You, it, it, it makes you focus on what the solution is and in, invite the person into that solution, not just good. Now, in my marriage, we came up with a wonderful thing where we both just say to each other, um, you know, something that you do that really drives me crazy is because it's those little things that build up and we just started laughing and saying it and it gets that stupidity out and it makes you realize that it's a thing that drives you crazy. Maybe it's not that important. That's definitely uh, one of my tricks. I'm like, if something is, I say, if something's bothering you once, and you're like, mm, note it. And then it happens again, especially in your personal relationships. I'm like, you know, that really is annoying me because after like a decade of that same thing happening, <laughs> it is now behavior. So hopefully you can, you can kind of interject there, but it's, um, you know, we're coming up with a couple of minutes left. Um, feel free. If you have any last minute questions, throw them in, but I want to kind of like summarize a couple of the key themes here and also kind of give you both a moment. If there's anything we might've missed, I mean, we covered a lot of ground from when the conversations are heated, when you have an opinion, how do you kind of lay this framework and put your opinions or feedback, your ideas out into the world when you're met with resistance or you're met with the awkward silence? How do you keep the conversation going? Um, we talked about kind of power and the room and looking around. I absolutely love listening to the corners because there are those who are in conversation that are speaking and listening, but everyone's listening listening and therefore participating. So if even paying attention to reading the room, as Elisa mentioned, um, being self-aware in conversations, this was an hour conversation and look at all that we covered. Mm. So we're having a five minute conversation, all of these dynamics are going on at once. So I often say, you know, I, at the end of a long day at work, I'm exhausted. And it's because a lot of times there's all of this layered into our day-to-day -day conversation. So to close out, I just want to say thank you both because this was just so good and helpful. I live in it every day and to be like with you in community as calm strategists, hopefully everyone else on the call also is able to pull away. Um, Thaler, Lisa, any last minute things before we close out? Well, oddly enough, I'm going to close by quoting the famous philosopher Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, <laughs> when, uh, and I, I want to just give a little piece of feedback to when you're the subject of a difficult conversation. Uh, I interviewed her about seven years ago for Blog Her, and I asked her how she dealt with internet trolls and, and all the criticism she got. And um, she said something that I surprisingly think of to this day, which is that um, you know, she kind of dismisses most people who don't know her and strangers, but if someone says something that really stings, then she sits with it and she figures out it must sting because there's a, something in there that is truthful to her. And I feel like that is something in these difficult times with these difficult conversations that we all could probably do is when you're hearing something and you have that immediate rage response or fear response or defensiveness response, just sit with it for a minute and don't, don't go with your immediate response and think about why, why is this activating me? Cause that's something, again, you control your, yourself. You can get to know yourself as well as you let yourself sit with it a little bit before you take it to other people. Uh, I'll quote Rebecca Solnit, who talks about- That is much more high-minded. Thank you, Thaler. Thanks for ending us on a more sophisticated note. Uh, it's a complimentary note. Uh, she calls for a democracy of equal audibility. And that work is comp itself is complicated. And we, we're not going to be perfect, but we do need to practice. Mm. I love that. Sit with it. We're not perfect, we need to practice. Um, and just my tip is we're all, we're all learning every day. So give yourself some grace sometimes <laughs> um, in this process and in this hard work of 
you know, becoming better humans. We're all in it together. And before we sign out, do you have anything to add? Thank you both so much for this. It's been a joy. And you're on mute. You're on mute, Anne. <laughs> well, that's one way to have an uncomfortable conversation. Um, I, you were all excellent and I have pages and pages of notes and I feel stronger and smarter and sharper for having spent this hour with you, which is really ultimately the goal for everyone to walk into the world um, feeling their strength. Um, and so I'm so grateful to you all for being here today. I'm grateful for all the women in the audience, all the folks in the audience um, who are here. And I'm really, again, thank you, Rachel and Sachs Works. Um, your plants have inspired me and I've really loved this whole series. It's been a tremendous partnership and I thank you all. Thank you. What a conversation. I'm going to sit with it. Um, what a series. It has really been, it's been really wonderful really just illuminating and such a treat to to sit with it with all of you uh through these five sessions um hot tip if a plant looks kind of droopy and brown it's real otherwise if they're looking like they're thriving i am at home right now i'm in my home studio the saxworks plants are truly lovely um but uh i feel like there might be some lessons on authenticity there but Anyhow, I want to thank you so much. This was a fantastic conversation. Really so many learning, uh, learnings and, and uh, amazing things to, to, I want to say sit with again. I'm just, uh, I, it's really now, now, now your interview with Gwyneth Paltrow is, is, is going to stay with me. Um, uh, a quick housekeeping note. If you would like to mine anything from the chat, I will give you the opportunity to do so now. Please, if there was something that you thought was useful and valuable and you want to share it out, by all means, please do so. Please tag all relevant parties also in the chat. Just trying to, trying to share the amazing wealth from all of these sessions. And thank you again for coming. We have tons of programming. A lot of it is in person. Please come to the space. Please go to saxworks.com, get that complimentary day pass. Uh, follow everybody. Um, on, on all the socials and please stay in touch. Uh, we would love to see you again and we're gonna hope, hope to have the list back um, to do another series or in some capacity very soon because this has been so wonderful. So have a wonderful day and um, thank you again for coming and sharing all this uh, with us. And again, thank you to our amazing speakers. <laughs>